How you guys doing? Did everyone have a pee break? Is everyone's bladders okay? Yeah. Um, I remember that during the premiere of, at South by, the first time I saw in the theater with an audience, we had to go up and do a Q&A right after, and I had to pee so bad. <laughs> and I ran to the bathroom line, and there was a line out the door, because our movie, you know, you don't want to leave ever, because there's no time to, to take a pee break. And so there was a line out the door, and I just had to cut every single person. I'm, like, I'm so sorry. I'm about to be on stage, please. And everyone's like, go, 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 They go. were so supportive. I it was know. really beautiful. So I was peeing, and people were saying, hey, good job, good job. <laughs> uh, but While that, you were peeing? Yeah, so now, whenever I'm finished this movie, I just, I just hope everyone's bladders are okay, because I know what you just experienced, and I'm sorry. We can go and <laughs> tap people on the back and it's, it's, congratulate yeah, them yeah, as exactly, they're peeing. Yeah. <laughs> we'll make the first five minutes of this really boring, yeah. <laughs> so you won't miss anything um, if you have to. I think they're all willing to wait. I mean, I polled the audience at the introduction. I think about 10 people here are seeing this for the first time. What? You have, like... Now you have Raise your hand fans. if you're first timers. Oh, Rock and roll. Okay. Okay. Welcome. Right. Thank you so much for coming, guys. You were uh, coming like nine months after a movie came out. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. No, but it's awesome. It's yeah. like how many filmmakers get to have this opportunity. It's so exciting that you got to see it here and not on your phones at home. So thank you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I guess I'd, I'd, I'd want to start. You've been talking about this film for like nearly a year. You have, but that also means you've been hearing so many people responding to this film and you have a huge following and so I, I don't know I just I, I want to know like how how your relationship to this film has changed you know since last March you know uh, you know do you see this film in a new light do you see new things um, today than you know back in March of 2022 yeah I've, I haven't watched it in a minute uh, I've seen it like like 70 or 80 times but uh, it's been a couple months, but even just like earlier today, like meeting some folks who had just watched it this afternoon, like every, every time we w talk to someone who just watched it, I like get a glimpse into what their perspective on it was, you know, like this uh, uh, like middle-aged lady who's like an acting teacher. I, I spoke with her briefly and she has like, uh, like a bunch of kids that she works with who kept telling her to watch it and she finally watched it and she like saw the movie through her kid's eyes and that was really beautiful and not what I thought, you know, the movie would do. Yeah, I, I think that's the answer. It's like you, you, you own the movie because it's yours and you've worked on it for so many years and then the moment you release it, it's evolved and become something that it will never be yours again. So it doesn't really feel like our movie anymore because every single time we meet someone, any of you who have I've seen it multiple times um, and we we hear your story, we hear what your perspective of it is, it completely changes and and feels like the movie isn't even like that that was not our intention. Whatever whatever you took out of it was yours and your own context and your story kind of uh, there was this beautiful chemical reaction. And so, you know, like we are just <laughs> Um, so on the one hand, it feels a little bit like a, like torture to still be talking about this movie for a year. Like if I'm going to be honest, like yeah, it's you know it's like when you play a, a, the FBI plays a pop song over and over again, and it's a great pop song, but you want to blow your brains out. So one half of me is like that, but then the other half is like I'm so grateful for those people, like that acting teacher, or, or you know some of the people I talked to earlier today who had just seen the movie again. Um, it, it's a beautiful reminder that this movie is, is still resonating with people and uh, we should still be proud of it, even if um, deep down it's really hard for us to remember why we made it sometimes. Um, just getting a refresher every every couple of weeks because we go to these Q&As and just, uh, you know, it's beautiful. It's incredible. I am so grateful for this journey. I don't think it's ever going to happen again like this. Because even if we somehow make another incredible movie that, you know, like, you know, gets Oscar nominated, like, what the hell? Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's what we want. No. <laughs> We're going for more Oscars. Um, but even if that happens somehow, it's never going to be like this because one year ago, no one in this room knew who we were, and like that, like, and we weren't expecting it. We were just some of them did. Okay, thank you, Swiss Army Man fans. Thank you. Yeah. But like, we got eleven nominations, and every single one of them was a first-time nominee. Like, nothing about this was expected, and that's what's so beautiful is just watching the the these people come out of our film overwhelmed because it's it's they couldn't even imagine a movie like this could exist. You know, that's beautiful. Yeah. Sorry, long answers. Only. No, and I think to we're gonna do one answer. To, yeah, for we're just gonna minutes. talk about this one thing all night. But to pull the curtain back a bit, just to ourselves, I think that a lot of times we we have to get on stage and we talk about the movie and it becomes stale. But the thing that's been so shocking is just how 
personal it is for us as well and how much I've seen my own reaction to my family through the chapters, right? Like you, we went from no one even acknowledging the movie exists to like me inviting my, my, my Chinese aunts and uncles to come to the premiere and they're like, that was interesting. And then to see them now very proud and like so happy and feeling this like all, all the things. And it's interesting how that as a reflection even of us interpersonally, how we have to talk about it too. Of like, we never thought we were gonna be the kind of filmmakers who would be Oscar nominated. We always were like, we're the subversive uh, indie filmmakers. And so there's a lot of it that is just organic and human as we go through this as filmmakers and I think as artists that I think it's important to just acknowledge that like this movie never changes, but everything around it keeps changing and keeps swirling and it's very beautiful in that way. So um, thank you for coming back, guys. Honestly, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. And, and I'll just add, I, I can't remember if he introed him properly. We've been working with our producer, Jonathan Wong, for over a decade. That's who that guy is. He's incredible. Yeah. Well, I, I think what you're, you're all saying, I think it goes back to this, you know, the concept of the multiverse. And I hope this is not too much of a torturous question that you probably had to answer many times. Yeah, we'll just but make a buzzer sound. Yeah. I mean, it's obvious. It's like it's very easy to get bogged down in the technical aspects of a multiverse. But I think what interests what interests me, and I think many many other people, is how you use it as this kind of elastic metaphor to reflect, you know, what it's like living today. You know, no matter who you are, where you are, and then how you transform that into something intimate and honest, I think is pretty remarkable. So I, I'm, I'm curious, you know, just where your initial fascina fascination with, you know, the multiverse concept began and, and where did that take you very early on in your research, maybe before you began like writing the screenplay? Totally, yeah. It's very I weird. Love it. it started because I was watching Sherman's March, the documentary, and one of you know, if for those who know, it's a documentary where he's trying to explore Sherman's March through the South. Um, but he uses it as a metaphor to explore his own, um, full, like you know, his own relationships with a lot of women. He goes through a bunch of women, and and one of the women he meets is a linguist who just talks about language, and she talks about modal realism, and this idea that um, for every change in a sentence, every, every for every sentence, there's a, another version of it that actually does exist. Um, and th I, th then I started going on Wikipedia rabbit hole, learning about the multiverse, and I never finished Sherman um, March. I don't know how the movie ends. Um, <laughs> it's good. You gotta finish I it. know, I know. But like, it, it was the most random place where it started. And then as we were you know, letting it percolate, we turned it into a couple short films. We did this really weird short film called Interesting Ball, um, which was kind of where we started playing with <laughs> yeah, you weirdos. We're, we're, yeah. Sh <laughs> we're showing it on Sunday. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. we're doing a shorts block on Sunday. Um, we did this other thing called Possibilia, Possibilia, Possibilia. That's right. Is that how you say it? It's been so long. Um, it's say it with an accent now? Possibilia. 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 Yeah. Um, it's an it's a interactive short film about the multiverse. And so I, I think the reason why we're drawn to it is because uh, I'm, I realize now I have ADHD. And my brain just is, con every time I, I, I see an image, my brain just instantly refracts it into 100 different uh, possibilities. Like that's, I don't know why my brain does that. And it's very overwhelming all the time. But I find a lot of comfort in organizing the chaos. And so the multiverse and the idea of infinity is so fascinating to me. And it just so happens to intersect with what you're saying, which is this this feeling of, um, I think Douglas Rushkoff calls it present shock. This, the fact that you're feeling everything right now, every th possible narrative you are experiencing right now, and is not just you, is everyone in the world, and we are crippled by it. We are completely uh, immobile because no one knows how to make a decision anymore. And so that's why we escape in social media or in our work or whatever. We escape in all these things that don't matter. And this film is us trying to refocus um, our priorities and figure out, okay, what? how do we pay attention to the things that truly matter? How do we pay attention to the ones we love? Because in a world that has uh, weaponized and uh, kind of tried to profit off of our attention, one of the most beautiful, powerful things you can do is give someone that attention, to pay attention. It's literally a, a, a toll that you're paying. And if you can pick and choose the right people to pay attention to or the right things to pay attention to, that's such an important thing for all of us to learn how to do right now. And this film was us exploring that through the multiverse, like you said. Mm. I had an anecdote, that's so good. Uh, 
my my autobiographical anecdote is just that like it, this movie started as a like a maybe an action short film like like the verse jumping idea was it and then I felt like the idea didn't actually capture these themes we'd been talking about for a long time and, and just how scary the idea of an infinite number of universes was. I was like, okay, going to one other universe sounds dinky and like, like if we're gonna make this movie, we have to go to an infinite number of universes and explore meaninglessness and that's not cinematic. Uh, and then like from very early on, we were like, but what if we did? And like, <laughs> and then that was like six years, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, you know, this whole concept obviously brings you, you know, you're, you're now working on a scale larger than ever with this film. And, you know, Jonathan, having worked with these guys for many years, you know, since music videos, from your perspective, were there certain restrictions or certain, you know, guardrails that maybe you established or noticed that Daniel's established that allowed everyone, the crew, the cast, to just stay focused on what the core, what the heart of this film was. Yeah, I'm very curious to hear what you guys think, because I don't, I don't, the way that I produce is not through like um, setting boxes to make it rigid. If anything, I try to build as big of a box to make it as fun to play in as possible. And um, I think that the, the thing that we, we just agreed on early on were just like a couple tenets of how we could pull off the movie. One is we need to have a, a playground where we can shoot a lot of things in one place. So we had to, like early on in prep, we had to find a location where we could shoot multiple locations, not just one. So we found this big old, like uh, it used to be Founders Bank, I think. It was like, is that uh, what it was? I think, like, Jamie always says like uh, nationwide mortgage, Okay, yeah, it was one of the subprime mortgage companies that yeah. built a monstrosity and stole the nation's wealth and then squandered it <laughs> and then died. Uh, yeah. And now there's like a 50,000 square foot <laughs> yeah, yeah. compound just sitting in Sydney It's kind Valley. of beautiful, our movie yeah. grew out of this. Yeah, so yeah. we grew out of the shit, which was the financial crisis. <laughs> Um, yeah, it got composted. <laughs> yeah, it composted. And, and, it into it. and for those who don't know, one of the most expensive things you can do on a movie set is move location. Just, it's, yeah. I don't know why transportation is so expensive and so. And big. the most wasteful in terms of uh, like gas carbon consumption, consum carbon. Yeah, yeah. Like you're just driving trucks and people to another place to just shove food in their mouth and then film some things and drive to another place. Uh, so it, it was one part out of efficiency. We had to shoot it there. Uh, one part out of just like laziness, we're like, we don't want to drive around, we just want to shoot and have fun. And so we ended up finding a place, long story short, where we could shoot the entire IRS building. We shot the entire Wong family apartment, the redressed it to the hot dog hand apartment, the RV, uh, the exteriors, where like you pan up and you see the IRS building, that was like a CG uh, uh, build on top of that actual location. The hot dog sign spinner was just down the road. The hibachi chef was just down the road. Uh, what else am I missing? A lot of quick little ones, but those are the big hits. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the big thesis. Was like we had to get that. And then I think the other the other guardrail, which was what we agreed on, was um, it's it's <laughs> quantity, not quality. And so they kept having to convince. <laughs> Our DP and our production designer just be like, trust us, this is gonna be fast, don't worry about it. And then we would say, but this one has to look great. And we would really focus on certain Same ones. with the actors, you know, we'd have to tell them like, this scene matters. And sometimes we'd have to be like, trust us, just scream. <laughs> It'll, it's fine. Like it's yeah, gonna be two frames. Yeah. Just look at the camera and scream real quick, please. A little thing that I, I don't think we've ever talked about, but one of my favorite shots in the movie is like when there's a rapid fire of Michelle and there's this moment where she's like, hmm, and does this little dance. They had yet been yelling like, okay, now scream, now, now act confused and all this stuff. And then it's like, and cut. And then she just was like, whoo, and then did that little shimmy, like out of character. And that's in the movie. <laughs> That's that's one of Dan Kwan's favorite things is he'll he'll step into the edit and he'll start going before we said action and after we said cut and start putting things in the movie. 
you find gold, especially, especially when you just don't have enough time to shoot like everything. You just you really do have to scrape the bottom of the barrel to find stuff sometimes. It's like, but also like I'll reframe it as like, even if you have all the time, that moment before and after is like honest. And and you can't and it's so fun to see what's there and it's not something you directed it's not something you like dictated or designed or scripted and it's just something that came out of the actors and there's yeah it's really interesting what's there what what were the guardrails that you guys put on yourselves as you guys were one of the about? one of the best descriptions of what you're talking about quantity over quality is the Larkin our, our our incredible DP who we've also been working with for about ten years now uh, he puts it in terms of like the way the human eye works and resolution. So like our eye really only like 10% of our eye is actually really good at processing imagery and giving you a high definition image. Then the next 30% out of it is like about maybe half as powerful. And then the peripheral is just like literally just blobs. You, you, you cannot process any of it. It's nothing, it's not good information. And then our brain fills it all in for us because it's created a model of the world. And so that's why even though my eye technically can't see Shiner and his glasses and everything, my mind invents it all. And so with filmmaking on a low budget, you have to pick what is the 10% that really matters that we should go super high definition? What's the thing that we're gonna spend money and time and resources in because that's gonna make the movie, make or break the movie. Then you kind of move out to the next 25%. Okay, this stuff can be a little bit shakier, but um, as long as it's there to, as scaffolding to that 10%, that's all that matters. So the hot dog hands have to look good. Right, exactly, that's, that's the, and but then- like and then, the set dressing at the IRS it has yeah. to look okay. And, and then obviously the peripheral is like the stuff where it's like, I don't, I don't care. Like you said, quantity or quality, just give me whatever you can because we just need the ingredients because we're trying to touch infinity. And so with that mindset, we were able to pull, up, pull this off without making everyone go crazy. I think one of the, thing, the reasons why so many directors yell all the time and everyone's stressed out and everyone's angry is because we're, they're seeking at perfection. And I, I'm, I am liable to be, I, 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 am, I am the kind of person who loves to be a perfectionist. And so uh, something I've learned over the years, especially working with Shiner, is how important it is to prioritize so that you don't you can be a good parent you know you can be a good person who actually is um, sweating the the important stuff and and then like letting go and being a little bit more zen about everything else yeah and the other thing about perfectionism is that it's dehumanizing right if in a collaborative art form I'll say like you can be a perfectionist under yourself and then you're dehumanizing to yourself in a, in a certain regard but I think when when you when you're working with other people and you say yeah the production designer Jason do this right if you don't give Jason some some creative freedom then it's just to use him like a computer or you know a, a robot and so what they do so well is that they're able to say Jason surprise us the, you know, this has to be like this all this other stuff surprise us so then that that 10 percent that we're talking about actually grows to like 20 30 percent because our crew really cares about it so anecdotally like that pinky when when Michelle's like Rah! and her buff pinky comes we told Jason Hamer our effects guy like you know like just do it like make it cool but it doesn't have to and he built this like model like this that we shot in a forced perspective that he could inflate and was like Argh! and same thing with the Rakakuni. Yeah, he went above and beyond. We said the hot dog hands have to look great. Rakakuni can look bad. It's still gonna be funny and he came in with like a like incredible animatronic. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm curious this this mantra of quality over quantity was there like quantity you know, quantity over quality. Or quality. Pardon yeah. me. Yeah, sorry. Of course. Yeah. 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 I, I feel like <laughs> like part of my job was reminding people like we're not making an Oscar movie here. Like, <laughs> like no, for real. I was like, ah, this, this is. Well, uh, yeah. I want to know if there, you know if is there a sequence that we see see maybe in the film for like just a second that took actually quite a bit of effort and time to actually execute. I like that question, yes. The very opening shot, uh, like I got mad, actively mad at Larkin, our cinematographer, and Dan for how often they would talk about it. To uh, just remind you, it's the push-in on the mirror that then bumps and then goes through. They the just watched it, John. I don't know, you know. <laughs> uh, and like, uh, and I, was, and I knew it mattered, but I was like, oh my God, the laundry list of things we have to figure out is huge. Are we still talking about which mirror and, and like, you know, which books are on the shelf or, you know, it's like a pretty simple visual effect in the grand scheme of visual effects. And, and we talked a lot about it, uh, but it, you know, now that it's resonated so much with 
audiences like were so proud of that opening shot and like it's one where it's like it's, oh it's one of the only sequences that i actually storyboarded before we shot because everything the whole, else, like opening couple yeah minutes. just the, i don't know why i was so obsessed about it but i just felt like this movie is so crazy we need to give them a little snapshot of what this movie is going to be which is it's it's about the family you get a, a little picture a little circle the family's in the middle just to kind of ground the whole thing and, and give um some dignity to some of the absurdity i think um and yeah it, it's it's super simple when you watch it but the, just the technicality of like okay what angle should it be when it's up and then how should we knock it down and then how she should come in and then we go into the thing and and we had a we basically built that whole apartment um inside the cafeteria of the um nationwide whatever um it's the shit pile in a lot of ways we built that whole thing for a lot of different reasons but for that shot because we knew that shot had to be a kind of a custom thing otherwise we probably could have shot it in some other apartment um it wouldn't have been as good i think jason and kelsey and the rest of the art team did an incredible job but um yeah those little little things like that i'm, I'm very proud of but yeah but that was that was definitely one of those 10 percent moments yeah and there's other ones where it was not supposed to be 10% and it became 10%, namely when Michelle's running on Harry Shum Jr.'s back in an open, wide parking lot. That was just supposed to be on green screen. We're like, it doesn't have to be good. And then the stunt team was like, no, I think we can do pick points in a parking lot and just do it practically with Michelle on his back. And, and I think we, I told him, like, I, I know you can do it, but we can't afford it. And then they, like, against our like direction went and tested it and sent us test videos and we were like that looks incredible never mind i was 100 percent wrong let's please please do that and both harry and michelle got to do their own stunts and actually run and have fun with each other and like act their asses off and it made that scene but, a, a real but it, it does yeah. go back to this question. People always ask, how'd you pull it off for the budget? You know, obviously it's not like the smallest budget, but for the script, it was, it was really restrictive. And I, I keep coming back to this, this Monsters Inc. kind of mentality where you scare the kids, you get a certain amount of energy. You make them laugh, you get exponentially more energy. And with so the, I would make jokes, <laughs> and then the crew would work harder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it, but it is like you you we found that you you lead with joy, you lead with creativity, and you and you leave with a lot of grace, saying like it's okay if it's not going to be perfect because we we know we have not given you enough to make it perfect, and because of that grace, everyone stepped up and gave us so much more than this budget should have contained, and that's why this movie is so incredible is because we just found the right people and gave them a lot of space and encouragement, and and of course sometimes we got angry and sometimes it was very stressful because no matter what you do, this this is an incredibly stressful job. Just the amount of money you burn every minute is like. It's, it's terrifying to calculate in your head while you're shooting. Um, and yet, if you can f somehow magically create a bubble that insulates your crew from that stress, it's, it, the, you know, it, it, this movie is a testament to that. I was just thinking about, an, uh, there's probably a lot of filmmakers in the audience, uh, people who want to make movies, hello. Uh, uh, something we accidentally did on Swiss Army Man was um, we mocked up a scene after the first two weeks of shooting and it was supposed to be just for us to watch, and it was like the um, uh, there's a scene on the bus and Jurassic Park plays, and uh, and it, we mocked it up, and we're like, oh, it works, it's pretty cool. And then John Wong, against our will, showed it to a bunch of the crew, like in the hotel we were staying at one night, and then everybody came to work the next Monday and worked so much harder because they were all like, holy shit, this weird thing works. Um, and so on this movie, we did it again more intentionally where we mocked up the fanny pack fight after the first uh, week of shooting. Like, so week two, we had like over lunch, we were like, we're screening a scene and our editor Paul had mocked it up and like, like people were like so stoked to see like, oh, it, it works. And we were like, let's go seven more weeks. And... <laughs> And it, and it really went a long way to kind of like pull people into the process and empower them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that tone is really felt in this film. I mean, it, like um, this this movie to me like kind of represents the alpha verse of your shared sensibility, and then that there's on one side this kind of chaotic absurdism, but then on the other, this very clear-headed sincerity. And your films often occupy the space in between that. Um, and I, so I'm curious what appeals to you about, you know, that tension in your movies? 
Yeah, it, it's something we stumbled on. Um, we we made like a very stupid short film you can Google called Puppets, and it's uh, it was our first action movie, and it's uh, it's like it was us made for ten bucks, like the cost of pizza. Basically. <laughs> there like wasn't yeah. a cinematographer. We would just hand us. the camera to people. Uh, but like uh, I think when we were editing it, we got embarrassed a bit that we'd made this like silly for silly sake thing. And then we started trying to inject sincerity into it and like make it as sweet and beautiful as possible. And then the finished product we were more proud of than we'd ever anticipated and people liked it. And then ever since we've been chasing, there's something about that mix that I think is like true to real life. Like, and, and people resonated with it and we do very much so like we watch when, when I watch something that's absurd and also heartbreaking, it reminds me of real life because like I think life's really silly like it's so dumb <laughs> you know <laughs> how the world's going uh, and also really beautiful and heartfelt and if I watch a movie that doesn't have both those things I'm like oh someone's someone's filtering <laughs> or something I don't know I, I do think a lot of my favorite artists and, and thinkers from the past have all been people who have looked at the world and realized that so many of the the labels and the sort of codified barriers and boxes that we put things into um, is all a fabrication and so you know uh, you look at someone like um, Mozart, you know, brilliant, genius musician. What did he do? Oh, music. Music, yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's pretty cool. But he also, um, he was an incredibly crass weirdo who loved fart jokes. And he was like, he's like, you know, if you've seen Amadeus, you know, that's not... A documentary about... A documentary, exactly. Mozart. <laughs> it's like, um, or like, you look at... Um, Benjamin ben Franklin, bro. Yeah, Benjamin Franklin. That's he, our go-to. He wrote a whole collection of essays, and the, the, the essay book is called Fart Proudly. And he goes on the whole thing about the, the medical and social and emotional uh, benefits of farting out loud, and we should all do it proudly. And like, I, I feel like it's one of those things where... Um, I find I find it very beautiful when you can look at the dumbest thing and still find something um, worthy of your attention in it, and it, it, it's the most extreme version of an empathy challenge. And so Swiss Army Man was like, how much can we? How much of a challenge of a hurdle can we put our audiences through? You're going to be forced to empathize with a farting dead corpse with a penis that works like a compass. Like what? <laughs> Uh, but like at the same time, it's like this is what the body does. Like so, like there's, it's like on the one hand, it's very silly, but then on the other hand, it's the most universal experience of of just having a disgusting, embarrassing, weird body. And so for this film, like we just kind of turned that on its head and pushed it even further, and just tried to. We're always trying to find ways in which we can um, pull away those, like like you said, these preconceived ideas of 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 what box everything's supposed to be in. Yeah, I, I was before I was in film, I was a musician, and I and. And uh, all, I think all three of us in different ways were raised in evangelical churches. And those two things combined, the power of music and the power of like religion, you realize from a young age how much you can manipulate the senses. If you like build the music at the right time and raise your voice at the right time, like people will faint, you know? And I think that, um, you know, knowing that in, in our bones and then you know, in college for me, I was a, I was a, philosophy major and I loved Dostoevsky and when we started working together like it was so funny for them I think like they, we'd be talking the dumbest things and I would just constantly be like oh man it reminds me of this thing in Dostoevsky and they're like get the fuck out of here man you know <laughs> but I do think it's true is like like the the, the little mantra that that was up on the wall as as they were writing Swiss Army Man was shame keeps us from love. And I think that's like, that's the brothers Karamazov. And then I think in, in this movie, it's, it's a whole, I, was there a, was there a specific mantra? There's a couple, there was most the, the mantra I wrote and was like, um, how do we, how do we survive this noise? Like that, 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 that was the question. I don't know if it was a mantra, um, but providing our own light exactly. or whatever. Right, yeah, yeah. That quote. Yeah, there, there's a Stanley Kubrick quote in a Playboy magazine interview. He says, uh, the most terrifying thing about the universe is not that it's hostile, but that it is indifferent to us. But if we can find a way to come to terms with this indifference, we have as a species the opportunity to create um, 
genuine meaning. And then the last sentence is, no matter how vast the darkness, we must supply our own light. And so, so that was one of them. Yeah, yeah. that last so, sentence. Yeah. So we wrote that on the on the on the blackboard, and it's really important. Like it's really important to reduce our movies into like uh, motivational posters that you put on a wall, um, <laughs> because of how chaotic it is, and it's so easy to lose the thread and lose the purpose and lose what that ten percent is that you're trying to really perfect. And so yes, shame keeps us from love. No matter how vast the darkness, we must supply our own light. Yeah. And the next one is um, Honk If You're Horny. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that's going to be the, the next movie. <laughs> I can't wait to see that movie. <laughs> I just have to say thank you so much for making one of my favorite movies of all time. Like, seriously, thank you. Uh, it's so cool that I can say that to your face. Um, <laughs> um, obviously, this film is like a labor of love. Right, and there's all these like minute details, and you know, people always like I've read so many articles about all of uh, the homages um, and the Easter eggs that you put in it. But I'm curious. I would love. I know that you're both humble kings, um, and I know that you're no different. I'm, this is so cool. I'm a dick. Sorry. You're great. Cool. I'm a total dick. <laughs> I like that. Um, but I would love to hear something that maybe you are really proud of about this film um, that maybe doesn't get talked about all that much that maybe has like been like glossed over like missed but something that you like really love that you have been able to create here thank you thank you i i have a good one because i just thought about this because it's a great question i'm gonna just step on you guys sorry i'm gonna be a dick <laughs> <laughs> so uh my father is was from Taiwan, and my grandparents also from Taiwan immigrated from China. And um, growing up, I had a very good friend named Byron, and Byron uh, was uh, loved to like he wanted to assimilate into my Chinese family as much as he could, and he loved wanting to like learn the Chinese words. But ironically, Byron in Chinese, if anyone is Chinese in here, you're laughing. Byron means white man. <laughs> and so there's an Easter egg in the movie, which is uh, Byron from church gets a divorce and now you think you can divorce. And so it's a, it's, it's a double meaning of like, y the white people get a divorce and you think it's okay to get a divorce. And I think that that speaks to my life growing up. And it, every time I hear that joke, I'm always like, Thank God for that joke. Because my grandma would make that joke, but I think it's very much this movie and it's very much my existence, our existence of this, this funny thing where in, even in the earnestness, my, my grandma was always just poking fun. She was not like, oh, you white man, but just, just was able to, as we're saying, like laugh at the absurdity of life and he was always welcomed in. So that's my little Easter egg for you guys. Oh, I have a new Easter egg I've never talked about. Uh, so our editor Paul Rogers is uh, like one of my closest friends, and it was uh, such a treat that like during COVID I had this project to work on with like my best friend, so we got to stay in touch. And uh, one of his favorite things to do when he's bored editing is to just like do bad sound design jokes, and then he'll like play it back for us and be like, "Hey, what do you think of this scene?" And they'll be like, "He'll have ruined it." Um, <laughs> Uh, but there's one scene where um, it's like an emotional scene where where Jobu uh, releases the bagel and she's like, um, if you're not coming, I don't care. I'm going. And she's going to go, you know, jump into oblivion. And a piece of paper hits one of our background actors in the face. And Paul put a really loud like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like paper sound. And uh, we kept it. <laughs> We turned it down, it's quiet, it's not distracting, but it's still in there, and I think uh, it's like an ode to, like, but when Paul first did it, it was so loud. <laughs> it was like, the whole point of the scene became whooped. Uh. Um, my, my little details, I, I, I think the ending is actually very scary and depressing a little bit, because um, happy, 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 family, 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 and then uh, the very last moment is just chaos and noise and whatever, and I... I I, I felt like I, we needed that to be the ending because every time you have a meaningful, cathartic um, experience in your life, uh, it's wonderful and you feel like you've gone through this hero's journey and you've earned this reward and then you go back to the real world and you're like, oh, the real world's is still awful and terrible and hard. And so I think the rest of Evelyn's life is going to be incredibly hard, but because of that, it's going to be that much more rewarding. And I think a lot of people 
talk about a movie as a very sappy, happy ending or whatever. And so to me, that's like the thing that I don't hear enough people talking about, which is like the rest of her life is going to be um, chaos and infinite, but it's going to be that much more beautiful when she is able to fight it. Thank you for your question. Well, first of all, I, I was just say I brought like eight people here. Um, everyone raise their hands. Thank you. Um, one for every time I've watched this They movie. don't seem mad at you. <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but secondly, I, I feel like one thing that's so amazing about this film um, is just that it's so inspiring. Like, it's, a, it's like a $25 million budget or something, whatever. $25 million, whoa. But it's like so small compared to these like giant blockbusters. And you can see like just how clever and smart and amazing like the ideas and problem solving is like behind in the filmmaking. And I feel like as young filmmakers, what's really underrated about this one is it just makes us so damn like fucking excited to make movies, which is crazy. And um, I don't know, just bouncing off that, like I just would love to hear about like any moments on set where that exhilaration, that excitement, like like something you really, really, really wanted to get right and then it goes right and it works and it's amazing and everyone says just whooping and hollering and I don't know, I just want to hear like that kind of excitement, like when that happened on set for you guys. Dope, yeah. Uh yeah, it was, it, it still sounds like a, 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 so much money, but it was like 14, it was like 14 uh, million. And, uh, but the, the thought that comes to my mind is I, I my, we've talked about this movie so much, I can't, I feel like the fanny pack was the end of week one. Yeah. No, was it week two? So the end of week one, we shot the fanny pack fight and uh, we shot it all in one day, the fight sequence. And we really wanted Key to do as much of his fighting as possible as much of it as possible and uh he trained really hard and so there's like a in the in the final cut we actually cut away from it but all in one take he we wanted him to swing the fanny pack catch it on his foot swing it around his neck rotate his neck to let it release and then throw it past camera um and kick it past camera and uh and we did like and he was really nervous that it would take him like 40 takes. He'd practiced it. He wasn't really good. And, uh, or he was, you know, it wasn't consistent that he could do it all in one. And then it was like take two or three that he got it. And that was, you're asking about a woo moment. Like, just like shooting a martial arts movie was like a dream of ours. And like shooting it with Michelle Yeoh, oh my God. And then, but doing it for a low budget was terrifying. What if we can't, what if it looks like a cheap version of a Michelle Yeoh movie? Like that would be the worst case scenario. <laughs> and uh, so like, I, I feel like that was our first fight scene. And we all just like at the monitor, like screamed and Key looked so proud of himself. <laughs> and like that, that was one of those moments for sure. I think the, the moment that I think most people like laughed at and was having the most fun the whole day was the butt plug fight. I think I think Michelle like broke character ten times within the day and was just like, "What did you idiots do to me? That why am I here?" Um, but I think that like, it, it, you have to treat it so seriously when you're shooting the scene. But then like I think all of us, even them, they would step back and be like, "What the hell are we doing here?" And that was a lot of fun. But one of the things that I don't think we've ever really talked about is that you know we were shooting this movie up until COVID and so we were shooting downtown LA for the Hong Kong alleyway and our last shoot day was in the Hong Kong alleyway and we had to decide it was really hard we had to shut down the movie and so this wasn't like a rah-rah moment but it was this moment that we realized oh we made something really special was we had to shut down the movie everyone was feeling like confused about the world and we all gave, gave each other hugs we're like I think this might be the last time we can hug each other for a while and so we're like fuck it, we're all gonna hug each other, and if we get COVID, whatever. And we all hugged each other to say goodbye, and Michelle was crying, and everyone started crying, and it was this like ripple effect of tears. And so we ended the movie with like a very emotional raw. It was very nice. Do we have time for one more question? Let's do, oh, okay. let's do two more. or three rapid fire. A quick fire. one, no, yeah. she's uh, doing this, uh, one fast one. <laughs> well, maybe we can go in the, in the back this time, uh, way in the back. Way in the back, I think baby blue, blue shirt, shirt. Yeah, let's yeah. go. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, I could ask you a, a very interesting question about the movie and, and, and how much uh, you went into it, whatever. Uh, I just wanna ask you, uh, 
I will. I watch this YouTube channel. This guy re- reviews movies. It's called like Nando V Movies. And in one of his videos, he talked about uh, he talked about your film, and he suggested that because you are called the Daniels, you should do a movie called The Daniels, starring Daniel Radcliffe, Daniel Kaluuya, Daniel Craig, and Daniel Day Lewis. <laughs> So I just want your thoughts on that. Thank you. I th- I th- no, I think it's a terrible idea <laughs> because we have a movie we want to make called The Book of Daniel, and it's a biblical epic uh, starring Dan Radcliffe, Daniel Kaluuya, Danny Trejo, Danny, Danny Glover, DeVito, Danny DeVito, <laughs> maybe Daniel Deadweiler, uh, Daniel Pineda. Probably not- Stormy Daniels. Yeah. Stormy Daniels, yeah, sure. Right. It's all, uh, yeah. We're, we're working on it. It's tough. It's a weird book. The Old Testament's hard. It's not very adaptable, but we're gonna, we're, we'll find a way. Now right. that we're we got to find a lion named Daniel. Daniel. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so... Uh, no, Danny DeVito's going to play the lion. It's going to be It's a great. half good yeah. idea. Um, but thank, thank you, you for guys. asking. Um, thank you guys so much for coming. This is amazing. Um, thank you. Thank you to the Lincoln Center for putting this on. It's, yeah. This was so uh, exciting. We have they, a whole week of movies to come to. We're doing the Grand Master right after this. It's gonna be really, it's just all of our favorite movies and all the movies that inspired this film, so. We're really uncomfortable to be the center of attention and, and we're really excited that they invited us to celebrate all the filmmakers we ripped off uh, <laughs> to, and screen their films. So, so, so please come back. So please come um, back and tell your friends but to go see But thank you so Grandpa. much. It means the world that you guys came out tonight. Thank, thank you. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thank you so much.